Jean, right, I'll let you go past and then, and then Glenn will come in. So if you go forward, then I can carry on going forward. I'll hold it this is your new accessory on your wheelchair then. I need it to be with my neighbours. Yes. Especially all vandalism you got today. Oh yeah, it's true, didn't get vandalised. We're saying that because we've had vandalism again. Yeah, we nearly didn't get here because of it. Yeah. So yeah. High quality filming this time. Oh yeah, get oh, the yeah, beeping. No, if you're thinking why she's got a mask on, it's the... Still wary about pandemic. Yeah. There's a pandemic back in the day. We don't know what the future might bring yet. Uh, it's so hard, look at these about. Well, these are stands, aren't they? So... Oh, well, it gives you an idea, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, it stops people pinching it, doesn't it, really? Oh, yeah. Drunk to be this area, oh yeah, trying to carry it. Yeah. But they would they would have been based on a wooden carriage or something, wouldn't they really? Something or you know. Oh sticking your head down cleaning it. Are you sure this is not loaded, mate? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> you accidentally pulled the thing. Oh, I didn't know there was a ball in it still. <laughs> you should know, you keep loading it. Some of the oldest workplace, ac workplace accidents. Yeah. It is quite a brutal thing to have a big metal ball whizzing at you. Oh, yeah. And the amount of damage it causes you. Yeah. As you can gather, everyone, she's in a disability thing, but not a wheelchair. But yeah, we're talking about cannonballs decapitating people, maybe, or well, the legs get... and stuff. Oh, it's a long story, this, but yeah, I'm still trying to get um, aim right in that, that the parts for the wheelchair's going to be available for five years. Mm. Because the sales rep now has changed his mind now, I want it in writing. Oh, right. Um, I've got in touch with Sunrise Medical. Um, I'm waiting for them to respond to say that they'll have it in production for another five years. And also I've been in touch with um, consumer authorities. The guy got it mixed up. The law isn't that wheelchairs are parts are available in England for five years. It's anything made in England that's a household appliance. So household appliances are covered by law, but wheelchairs, there's no laws on them at all. All right. Weird. Yeah, it's bad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so before I buy a, my new wheelchair, I'm trying to get it confirmed that I'm going to have the parts for five years, which is proving to be quite difficult. I don't know if anybody else has had this problem. And everyone thinks it's fun, thinking you can just wheel about in wheelchairs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Didn't if you can't get out of them. No. Right, they have opened. So you're shopping now. Ah. Yeah, she's getting armed up. So we're getting the Game of Thrones. Dark Vader. You can buy Dark Vader. Or you can buy guns here. Or Stormtrooper's helmet. So, quite interesting stuff. Interesting thing. So technically, we've filmed this before, but now we've got high definition as well. So I'll go down here. I've got my little sister. So the idea is, you've got a mirror, so you can see the stuff. Obviously, at the time, my kids just wanted to play on the list. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another film. It's been a long time I've been here. Uh, uh, got 
some cannons over for the they blocked up and stuff, but you've got manging up on the wall. Don't know if that's gone blurry. Might have. I don't know when these are going blurry. So. Yep. So we've got a big giant model here. As we all know they used to like shooting tigers and uh, yeah, can pause if you want. No sister. So somewhere in the exhibit is my sister. And we're looking at a great big giant model elephant. I don't know if this is really focusing well. Might be in dark. Trying to find her own optical cars, aren't you? Generally speaking, they were not made up of nine men, split into pairs, so there's 
uh, much better for us than Nova, and each pair has a slightly different task to perform whilst on this range. So what I'm going to do is just go through each pair and go through what it is that we're using and what it is that we're trying to do. Now, the first pair to attack, or the uh, first pair to enter, I'd really say, an enemy trench were known as the Bayonet men. They were chosen for their strength their speed and their efficiency of using this rifle. Now this is the standard issue rifle for British and most Commonwealth troops throughout the First World War. It goes by a whole bunch of different nicknames, but to give it its true designation, this is the short magazine The Enfield Mark III Star. You may hear it referred to as the SMLE, the Lee Enfield, the 303, lots of different names for essentially the same gun. As far as how you use it is concerned, well, to load it, the first thing you do is you take this bolt and you pull it up and back. That exposes your breech. The breech is the, the hole at the top of the here. You will then take a charger or a stripper clip of five three or three calibre rounds. Just look, get it out about. A bit like this. Now, these are the dummy rounds, these do not work. Uh, in fact, they never work. You take a charger of five, pop it over the breech, and you push them down using your thumb. And those five rounds sit quite happily inside your magazine, that magazine the box at the bottom. However, the magazine holds ten, so you do that twice. Once you've loaded it, you press your bolt forward and lock it down. That essentially strips the first round out of the magazine and chains it around here in the barrel. You aim it at the person you don't like, and you squeeze the trigger. Back one shot. For your second shot, you lift your open bolt up and back. This injects your empty cartridge but allows the new ones to, to move up to the magazine. Pop, hold it down, and rinse and repeat. Alright? So you're looking to get an average of 12 to 15 aim shots a minute, which today is a lot, but it's quite average for a weapon like this. You can increase your range of fire by keeping hold of both at all times and using your middle finger trigger is a much smoother action and allows for a rapid rate of fire of up to 38 aim shots a minute, which is the world record set in 1914. Now I did mention that these guys are called the bayonet men, so I should probably show you the bayonet. Uh, the bayonet we are using is the 18 inch sword bayonet. It's so long, because it's 18 inch long, and it looks like a, a little sword, so uh, not a huge stretch of the imagination. A weapon like this fixes onto the end of your firearm like so, and what you've got is a great big spear. Now a weapon of this size really designed for a very different conflict. It was more suited, the size of it, to conflicts such as the Napoleonic uh, conflicts, the you know, Battle of Waterloo, a hundred years earlier, where you've got men dressed in red coats and green fields stood with their bayonets pointed forward to stop cavalry charging into them. But to be honest with you, cavalry charges weren't very effective during the First World War for a number of reasons. First one being that every single soldier was equipped with a high-powered, long-range, accurate rifle, not a musket that uses gunpowder. Another issue is the fact that we had machine guns, which they didn't have a hundred years ago. And trust me, machine guns really do put a pain for a good cavalry charge. Uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, you're not stood in an open green field, you're inside a trench, you're in a ditch, a uh, very narrow, uh, winding space, not suited for mass cavalry action. So this design was a little obsolete by the time we get to the First World War, but it's still being used. In fact, if you're trying to move around a trench, be it your own or an enemy trench, a weapon this size is a little bit big. Now, I just want to very quickly dispel a myth about the bayonet. And swords in general. Can everyone see this crew running down to yeah, something that gets taught in the military even today? Now I'm going to let you into a secret. Please not go try this yourself. If you stab somebody, don't. But if you stab somebody, they will bleed regardless as to whether there is a groove in your dagger, in your bayonet, or your sword. This channel does not let blood out. The hole you just made lets the blood out. This groove is called the fuller and it's there to lighten the blade. 
You've got a great big chunk of metal hanging off the end of your firearm. If you're using a sword, you've got a great big chunk of metal in your hand. By taking metal out of the thickest part of the blade, you make it lighter. The concave shape also makes it that little bit stronger as well. There is another myth that suggests that if you stab somebody, your bayonet might get stuck inside them. So this groove lets air in so you can pull it out. Well, I've got to be a little bit grim. If you want to get someone unstuck from your bayonet, there are easier ways of doing it. You've got a foot so you can kick them off. You can twist the bayonet to make the hole bigger. Alternatively, if you've still got some rounds in your firearm, it can make the hole bigger in a whole more gruesome way. So there are lots of different uses for a bayonet, but this groove is just there to lighten it. Nothing to do with blood. Now, with all that in mind, some people didn't like using the bayonet, simply because it made your weapon too big. So some soldiers, not all, some soldiers would take stuff like this with them to battle. Now this is not a piece of standard issue equipment. This is something you would make yourself or pack by from your shop or off your base. It's a trench club bat. This particular one is a rounded bat with leather strips with a hot nail attached with a hot nail boot. And you don't need me to tell you how it was used. It's a bludgeoning weapon. Essentially, it's a medieval mace, and that's a really sad, one of the many sad things about the First World War. It's often referred to as the first modern war. We've got aeroplanes, we've got tanks, we've got shelling, all sorts of things. But the reality is, it often came down to young men in muddy fields hitting each other with weapons, something as simple as this a medieval mace, if you like. Uh, but because it's so nasty, I'm going to tell you something nice about them. Uh, a lot of clubs are made out of wood, so some soldiers would carve things into the handle, such as little mice running up and down, roses or ivy winding their way up the head. Uh, so some of them can be nice examples of trench art. Uh, we don't have any of those, we've just got the horrible nasty ones. Uh, but keep your eyes open for others in other military museums, so you might be surprised. There you go. Now, these guys are the first ones to uh, enter the trench, but they're not actually the first ones to attack it. Uh, the first people to attack the trench are the two men stood behind the bayonet men. These guys are called the grenadiers or the bombers. As well as a rifle over their shoulder, they're carrying 12 of these each. The number 5 hand grenade, or the Mills bomb. Now, the Mills bomb would be dangling off the bandolier, attached by the pin just there. And what you would do, if you grab it with your right hand, you would pull it off your bandolier and using a straight overarm throw, you would chuck it over the head of the bayonet man through the air into an enemy trench, it would explode and make it safe for you to enter. And then once you enter the trench, you would keep throwing them as you move along to ensure your own safety. So how exactly does something like this work? Well, first thing you do is Hold it in your right hand. I'm sorry if you're left-handed, but you're trained to fight right-handed in the British Armed Forces during the First World War. You would then take your thumb or your index finger and remove the pin. Now, has anyone ever seen a film where usually the hero of the piece uses their teeth to pull a pin out? <laughs> it looks great on film, but trust me, you don't want to do it in real life because that is what's holding uh, the grenade to your bandolier, the pin. And if it was so easy to pull out that you could use your teeth, then the grenade would just fall to the ground and, uh, and the drop of a hat would work. This does not come out easily. If you use your teeth, you will lose your teeth. <laughs> but it's cheap then, then just like the ground. Regardless, thumb in next finger, you pull the pin out, you've got your pin in this hand, you've got a grenade in this hand, and nothing's going to happen. So you can spend the rest of your life holding on to this and you'll be fine. I mean, you'll be nervous, probably, I think you after a little while, but you'll be okay. You see, your fingers are currently holding down this lever. Now, before you pull the pin out, the pin is holding this lever down instead. Now, as soon as you release this lever, which you have to do when you throw it, it will suddenly spring up. And by springing up, it releases a plunger inside the grenade, and that's a bit like striking a match. That lights the fuse. Once the fuse has lit, you've got seven and a half seconds before this explodes. And you've got to make sure that you are not within 30 feet of this, because it could kill you, uh, if you don't find cover, of course. Now, a lot of people might say that seven and a half seconds isn't enough time to do this effectively. But to be honest with you, it proves to be too much time most of the time. 
If you imagine being close to a trench, you're not going to be throwing this 30 foot, you're going to be throwing this 10 foot to make sure that you hit where you want to. So you're going to pull the pin out, you're going to chuck it into a trench, it's going to land in the trench, and any unfortunate enemy soldiers who are there are going to do one of two things. Run away, which is what I would do, or if you're particularly brave or arguably desperate, you pick it up and you chuck it back to whoever chucked it at you in the first place. As you can imagine, soldiers don't like it when their grenades are returned to them. So what they would do is they would start cooking grenades. Now to cook a grenade, you would remove the pin, and whilst it's still in your hand, you release the lever. That might be fuse, and you start counting. One, two, three, and then you chuck it. Hopefully you've given yourself enough time to find cover, but not enough time to hit you and throw it back. Now this is dangerous. If you ever get your hands on a grenade, I don't know why you would. But if you did, don't do it. It's a very silly thing to do. Uh, and accidents did happen. So by 1916, the government took matters into their own hands and they shortened the fuse. So the fuse itself only burned for four and a half seconds. They'll find out all by themselves. Uh, regardless, that's long enough to chuck it, but on average, it's not long enough for them to chuck it back. Now, if you're throwing this continuously, you are going to run out pretty quickly. So these guys rely on the next pair of men to resupply them as they move along the trench system. Now these guys are called the carriers, and unsurprisingly they are carrying a very heavy box full of roughly 60 extra grenades. Now I don't know about you, but if someone said to me, would you like to run across no man and leave the worst job uh, is reserved for the final pair of men? These guys are called the uh, spare men, and unsurprisingly, they are there to replace anybody who gets killed or incapacitated during a raid. Now, this is a very difficult thing to do, and once again, this is what the manual says they are supposed to do. If you imagine being on a raid with your friends, and chances are you're quite close to the people you're serving with, if you're a spare man and you see one of your best mates hit the ground, it's your job to go up to that person, strip them of any useful equipment, and leave them behind. You will replace them and do their job for them, but clearly they can't do it anymore. You are not there to give them any medical aid, you are not there to check if they're even alive. You're just there to strip them and replace them. Now, in reality, I don't know if that's how it actually works. I don't know if I can leave someone behind if I saw that. Then again, I'm not a soldier fighting in the First World War. So I'll leave that one up to you uh, and your own experiences to know whether you would leave someone behind or not. If they are alive, incidentally, they've got two options. They can wait for you to come back and hopefully you'll come back the same way. Or they can make their own way uh, home. If they can't do any of that, then they're left to go on the land. But let's imagine that the spare men are able to get to the trench without having to replace anybody. It's their secondary role to make sure that you don't get flashed, to make sure you don't get surrounded by anyone. To do this, you would take an entrenching tool, which is something everyone has. You can see it in the back of my webbing, you can see the, uh, the pouch from the head of this uh, spade, if you like, and the, uh, the shaft is kept next to the bayonet. So you just make that up when you get into the trench. You would take some empty sandbags, fill it up with mud, and you block one side of the trench. And that just makes it more difficult for the enemy to come and surround you. It also makes an incredibly effective hand-to-hand -hand weapon. Uh, some soldiers need to sharpen the edge of this to make sure it's a sharp and razor blade, just in case we got into a sticky spot. Now, it's all very well me saying all of this, but how do we know they actually did it? How do we know during the cross of our land, gathering information, rather than just getting halfway across, stopping and having a cup of tea for six hours. How do we know the servant aren't stopping to help their friends? Well, the final member of the raiding party, he's the guy in charge, uh, the NCO, the non-commissioned officer. And his method of encouragement is this, the Mark VI Webley Revolver. And when I say encouragement, what I really mean that he will order you to do something. He will not ask, he will not suggest, he will order you. And if you refuse, or if you hesitate for that bit too long, he'll cock the weapon and he'll point it at you. And he'll tell you again. And if you refuse a second time, or if you continue to do nothing, he'll squeeze the 
trigger, and next to you, cowards. That's it. No final, no more warning than that. That's all you get. And that's the sad reality for so many people during the First World War, that so many young men were executed for cowardice when they were simply scared. I think it's safe to say that every single one of us would have been scared during the particular conflict, and I do not believe there was a single coward amongst them. However, that was the reality for many people. So let's imagine this is not being used against a person, let's imagine it's being used against a, a paper target. How do you use it? Well, it's a double action revolver, which means all you need to do is squeeze the trigger and it will all the work for you. Now, as that is squeeze the trigger, keep your eye on the cylinder and keep your eye on the hand. It'll be quite hard to see at the back, I'll do my best. If I continue to do this, the hammer will eventually fly forward and discharge the weapon. It was fired. Now this is a fast way of using the firearm, but it's actually quite difficult. That trigger is very stiff. What begins to happen is your hand wobbles and falls low and slightly to the right. So it might be fast, but it's inaccurate. If you want to fire it quickly, you use single action where you manually cock it and you squeeze the trigger. And you'll notice that I manually cock it it will glued on.
offended me. <laughs> he surrendered. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Oriental and Self Defense Galleries. I'm Keith. This is Mike. We're two of the people who work full time trying to bring the museum to life for you. So, what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes is some of what we know about combat in the period of the Viking invasions of Saxon England. So, the end of the 700s, beginning of the 800s. But we're talking about weapons and armour that have been around for hundreds of years before that, and which will continue to be around for hundreds of years afterwards. Now, for me, I'm playing the Saxon, and I'm a member of the Fear, the group of men who will be called up to fight in the event of a Viking invasion. Problem is, not everybody would have been well armed. We tend to assume that this kind of early medieval combat was all warriors, well armed, hacking away each other with swords, axes, jabbing away with spears. The reality was, some of the men would have been on the battlefield with a bare minimum of armour. And some of them, like me, would have gone with no armour at all. And it would have been all, in my case, down to my wits as a fighter and the way in which I use my weapon. So in my case, weapon is the simplest, oldest weapon of mankind. A spear. A blade wooden shaft with an iron or a steel head. However, the way I use it can still hold my enemy at bay. And my enemy is... Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am dressed uh, as a Viking Muska, Hauska, the fighting elite of any Viking army. So, what happened right here? So, uh, I've got a wooden shield. Now, this is a smaller, round, jewelling shield. If I was going into warfare, I might have a slightly larger one that covers me from my uh, chin down towards my knee. Now, we all know how a shield is used. Raise it, lower it, move it side to side, stop incoming attacks. But don't forget, you are carrying a great big chunk of wood, so it can be used offensively as well. It can strike your opponent with it, and that's really going to do a fair amount of damage. As far as other protection goes, I've got a male shirt. Now, often we'll refer to it as chainmail, which is okay, but chainmail really is a Victorian term. You see, mail is an old French word, maille, which means chain. So if you say chainmail, you say chain, chain. Uh, two different languages. Regardless, it's made of thousands of interlinking steel rings, making it incredibly flexible with strong mesh. And against a cutting attack, this will protect me very, very well. You're not going to cut through this. Against the impact, however, I'm still going to feel it. So I've actually got another layer of protection in the form of a gamson, a padded jacket. It acts like a pillow. So if someone did strike me, it's just going to absorb some of that impact, make injuries like broken bones and eternal healing less likely. Possible, less likely. The big problem with metal, aside from the fact it's flexible, is that it's full of holes. That leaves you vulnerable to very thin or narrow arrow heads, but also leaves you vulnerable to thrusting attacks. And of course, the spear which Keith is using is a fantastic thrusting weapon. He may well be able to break the leaks of this nail shirt if he stabs me hard enough. I hope he does. But if he did, he might be able to break them and enter the body. As far as my head is concerned, I've got this. The hell. This particular version is a single piece of metal, but sometimes you'll see it's a steel or iron frame with uh, panels riveted on the inside. It's decorated with a pair of eyebrows, so it doesn't like eyebrows. You've got the nasal at the front to protect yourself from something cutting across your face, and the back of your neck is protected by even more metal, the Avatel just there. Something like this, in fact, all of my equipment really suggests I'm incredibly rich. Or at the very least, I'm serving someone who's incredibly rich, and they've either given me or loaned me this equipment. The final thing that I am carrying, which Keith does not have, is the sword. This is a single handed, broad blade weapon with two sharp cutting edges, because that's what it's really designed for. I'm going to hack, I'm going to slash my way through my opponent. It does have a pointed tip, so I can use it for thrusting attacks, but I'll be honest with you, that's not really what it's designed to do. Something like this, if I get someone wearing the same equipment, okay, it's not going to cut through, but I can use that as a bludgeoning weapon. But against my Saxon opponent today, he is incredibly vulnerable to all of the attacks I can make with a weapon such as this. Speaking of the attacks, shall we go through? Let's go through. Now we said you time. Uh, as the Vikings successively settled across uh, eastern England, 
So you've got borderline areas, Saxons and Vikings living together, very often peacefully, but sometimes violence would flare up. One of the ways it would flare up would be in a duel, which is why my colleague is carrying a dueling shield, and not a battlefield, a large battlefield shield. So what we're showing you here in a sense is the maximum number of moves that we can think of that you can do with a weapon like this and weapons like those. You couldn't do many of these moves in a battlefield situation, you'd be packing too close. So we're going to assume that it's, it's a duel between two men where you turn up with what you have and you fight to the death. Yeah, this is personal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, as we move in towards each other, I'm going to try as much as I can in this fight to use my spear to keep him at maximum length. If I make the first attack, where can I go? Well, I could try and go low into the leg with a slash or a stab. Problem with that is that I open myself up to being hit over the top. It's actually much better to try and draw your opponent out by any high if you can. He can't get his head completely behind his shield because otherwise he wouldn't be able to see what was going on. So my first jab is over the shield into the eyes. Stepping off the side of raising the shield. My opening attack, that's a little bit toward the groin and the femoral artery. If I get that, he's done more very quickly. I step back, beat that aside. Now I try and use the butt end of the spear to stun him. Equal to the hell up, I'm going to want to raise that shield just for hand insurance. This time, I'm going to cut to the wrist. That was handy, that's my good win. Whoa! I jump back, drawing my hands out of the way. I fall over and lose the fight. <laughs> so, keeping my balance, the uh, hands are now raised and in line with the throat. So perhaps a single cut from this position will not only take his hands, but his windpipes. So once again, I'm jumping back now, he's forcing me back into a corner. Some fighters will say a corner is a great place to be. Well, maybe, but I don't fancy it. So from here, before you can get another attack going, I take a jab again into the face. He beats it off, I get the chance to get back into the fighting area, and we both get a chance to size each other up. So now I think, well, you know, he's, he's worth every penny, this Viking. He knows what he's doing with those weapons. He's got a lot of protection. I'm going to try and change the way I use the weapon. Maybe if I change the tactics, I've got more of a chance against him. So what I do is turn my spear now into a giant two-handed sword, effectively. I grab it by the butt end. And I whirl it around to try and take his legs out from underneath him. Luckily for him, he avoids that. But now I bring with tremendous force the spear crashing down onto his head. Raise the shield for insurance. This time I'll turn it straight across the back of his neck and take his head off that way. So I beat the sword up and away, whip it round. And what I'm trying to do now is, despite that Adam tail here, if I can crack him, an almighty one, on the back of the neck, between the bottom of the helm and the top of the double layer of mail here, I'm just going to bowl him across the fighting area. Ooh. Tactical retreat. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the big issues that I'm having is Keith's maneuverability. My armor doesn't stop me from being able to move, it's heavier, so it's a little bit more tiring. So, so far, I've given you the initiative. Uh, but this time, I'm going to take the initiative for myself, step in, and completely negate the advantage he has with that spear. Move it out of the way, I'm going to take his leg off by the knee. Whoa! Jump away from that. Now, I'm trying to do that. He swung his sword, and both his weapons are on the left hand side of his body. Yeah. So, actually, he's very, very vulnerable here now. So, what I do is I take a chain hitting there, because I know he knows I'm going to do that. It's the second move I'm hoping he will get. Alright, so blocking with a sword and shield. You'll notice though, the sword is on the outside of the shield. From this position, if I want to win the fight, all I do is send it down and turn this Saxon hand into a bunch of Saxon sausages. You're ready? Yes. Good. I'm ready. Uh, three, two, one. Go. <laughs> so I wrench my hand back to stop the fingers getting cut. I stagger back. My spear is in a dreadful position. And remember, I don't have any armour of my own, so whatever he does to me now, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I'm going to cut him in two. Hurrah! So what I do is raise the stair, hoping to intercept that blow before it then gathers too much power, and that means that even though this is wood, I might just stop that sword. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I've what? got an idea. What? You move. <laughs> you did have to be earlier on today, if you that's, that's true, you did. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was showing. We have absolutely no evidence they kicked each other in 
Yeah, I'd have to get it from yeah. somewhere. I'd get it from somewhere. I tell you what, look, if you do that and it goes wrong, yeah. you won't be able to finish the show. No. So can you please just do something else, preferably the old choreography? Yeah, I'd win it. <laughs> oh, so, uh, promise the machine I have a number of options. Now, I could use the pommel of my sword to strike it under the chin. I'll be honest with you though, I don't think that is the best form of action. You might just wrap the spear around my neck. So instead what I'm going to do is the shield offensively. In reality, I'll probably use the rim of the shield. That's a bit mean. I'm going to use the flash of the shield to strike him in the chest. Oh! And before we have a chance to react, ah, come down. Finish off. Done. Now, when we did it earlier, of course, the fight went on a bit longer because I had a way of getting out of that. Yeah. I'm not winning, so I have a feeling like you probably like to try and get your own back. Yes, yes I would. Uh, well, I didn't get in all this stuff for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so now's the chance to decide. I know we're up here, I'm, I'm, I'm a southern boy, as you can probably tell from the accent. But I'm we're up in Yorkshire now, and we tend to find it's fairly split down the middle here between people who think of themselves as being Saxons and people who think of themselves as being Vikings. So, you know, time for you to decide who you really want to win in the last round. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Hold on, team. This is Dane Law. Vikings are the home team, I'll have you know. So who wants the actual home team to win? The Vikings! Yay! 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Alright, well, if you wanted your home this bad, you would have defended it better in the first place. Yeah! around here. Oh no, she's trying to drive off. She can drive off. Okay, it could be a light. I do look blurry here. Kind of a little bit. So, there we are. And this should be a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Very bad. So, 
man could have been extinct by goats. By goats. Look at that vicious beast there. That's coming charging at the man. Well, should be grateful those young uns, you know, these young kids. They're getting attacked by vicious goats. Oh yeah. The man needed another animal to get another animal. Yeah, I think if you're firing that at them, that, that, there'd, be, there'd be no left of them, would there? So I think that was just full of powder and... Might be wrong though. Nah, there were vicious ducks back then. <laughs> yeah, they had the rows of teeth. They were very big. <laughs> So what I'm going to do, some of you will have seen our previous demo, which was showing you some fighting techniques between uh, Vikings and Saxons around about the end of the 700s, beginning of the 800s. Our uh, same time period we're looking at here, because that was the period in which a sword-making style called pattern welding reached the pinnacle of perfection in print. Now, this was a style of sword-making that had been going on all over the world, and it was the culmination of several hundred years of technological advance. So a pattern welded sword is one that has a blade like this. If I bring it round. Yeah, the great big tent.